Hey, friends. It's good to see everybody. Hey, let's just um, kind of make sure everyone feels welcome at all the other campuses on the other side of the camera. So we say hey to everyone over to Edgewood and Abingdon and Aberdeen, Mountain Road, online people. My heart is all full today uh, because we get to celebrate that thing that's like this, you know, the most important moment in history and the thing that has changed uh, everything for all of our lives. And we celebrate it by saying he is risen. And you say he is risen indeed. You just saw that clip for At The Movies. Um, if you have not been around Mountain before, I know some of you are new. That's one of our favorite times of the year. We just like to dig into films and pull out like the biblical truths that we can find and apply them in a really practical, down-to-earth way that we can all use. Um, it's a good time for uh, you to be thinking about someone that you'd enjoy going to the movies with. And uh, invite them along, because I promise you they, will not, they won't just see a movie. They'll hear... Uh, they'll hear from God, and uh, you probably know someone that needs to hear from God. So uh, we're, we'll start that next week, and uh, that's always a fun time. It runs a few weeks starting next week. And then today is obviously very special, not just because it's Easter, but um, because we're going to see some people from right here step into the waters of baptism in a little bit, which is kind of special and cool. They're ready to say that they want their past to be washed away and to begin a new life with Jesus as only Jesus can do. And a few people have already made that decision, which is really, really amazing. I believe that in the next few minutes, several more, many of us perhaps, are going to make the same decision and spontaneously decide to get baptized. So that's kind of cool. Um, so uh, now over the last few weeks, we've been in a series. Uh, some of you already know what the series is called. We, we preach in kind of series. What's the series called? If you know, you know. See what I did there. Okay, so see if you can finish this line. I am not throwing away my... It's interesting. You see how young all the voices were? All the old people didn't get it. Um, if you know, you know. That's from Hamilton. Now you know. All right? How about this one? Um, I'd love to be an Oscar Mayer. Yeah, some, some of you are like, what are we doing right now? It's like... Thinking about wieners in church, so it's like, yeah. Uh, how's the whole thing go? Like, my baloney has a first name, it's O A C E R. My baloney has a second name, it's M A Y E R. I love to eat it every day. And if you ask me why, I'll say, because Oscar Meyer has a way with. Yeah. I love all these kids in the front row are just like, what is going on? <laughs> but if you know, you know, right? Or you could say more accurately, if you're old, you know. If you know, you're old. <laughs> um, so, what's this all about? So, here's the thing. Everybody thinks they know something about Jesus. Everyone's got an opinion and an idea about him. Just ask anybody. But the flat out truth is that most of what so many people think is actually just dead wrong. And so we've been diving into what these seven different instances in the Bible where Jesus just straight up says, here's who I am. And he gives these powerful metaphors. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am... Uh, the vine, I am the good shepherd, because he wants us to know. And once you see and understand it, it's like you know and you can't go back and unsee it. You, you can't go back to the kind of weird little small Jesus that we were taught about that has no correspondence to the real Jesus. And honestly, that's been our prayer. A lot of people have been praying about these next few minutes that every single one of us would come face to face with the living Christ who 2,000 years ago walked out of a grave and is here in our midst today just to be confronted by him and his truth and maybe held and assured by his grace. So you'd be able to say, I know who Jesus really is and what difference that makes in my life and that you would respond accordingly. That's, that's the whole point of why we're here. Now, our, our hearts and minds obviously have been focused the last several days on the tragic collapse of the Key Bridge down in Baltimore. And of course, our first response is to pray, and we have been and will continue to pray, especially, I think, for the families of, of uh, the perished, and, uh, but also just, I think, for comfort and peace for a whole region and just the unsettling, chaotic nature of everything that's going on, that God would be at work in ways that only God can, right? But you know, in addition to that, the image of a bridge collapsing is actually very, very powerful, isn't it? And, and kind of haunting in a way. 
Because a bridge is something you trust. A, a, a bridge is something that you rely upon to get from here to there. And you do it without even thinking about it. You just drive over it every day. I mean, those steel trusses that were erected 47 years ago have carried people. Probably all of us have been across that bridge. 40,000 people go across that bridge every day without giving it a second thought. That span from, what is it, Sparrow's Point to Hawkins Point, 1.6 miles, those trusses have been there. But one ship in the middle of the night, in the wrong spot, the wrong place, wrong time, the whole thing comes tumbling down and it kind of like, ooh, kind of gets you. And that is exactly what happens in life sometimes, isn't it? Every one of us knows what it's like when like a bridge to hope collapses. When, when the path that you had mapped out in front of you and we're relying upon to get you to something, to somewhere, all of a sudden isn't there. It leaves you kind of, well, stuck, if you will. That's why in wartime they always go for the bridges because if they know if they can take the bridge out, the enemy isn't going anywhere. They're just stuck, right? They just blow up the bridge. Leaves you defa defeated and demoralized and whatever. And so with the key bridge, now we're going to figure out some other very inconvenient long routes around and there are other ways. But you know what? In real life there are times when, when a bridge connects you to hope and it blows up or goes away, we really are super stuck. When Melinda got married, she saw her future marriage as this bright, beautiful thing on a distant shore, and her wedding was like this bridge of hope that she traveled confidently every day toward that dream in her mind until one day she wakes up and discovers that he's been cheating on her, and the bridge just like collapsed, and hope seemed like this impossibly distant thing, and that like the path forward was like, I don't see it. It was just like a drop-off. Michael has struggled for a long time with some bad habits, you could call them destructive behaviors. Some of it he inherited, some of it he kind of learned on his own. And he hates it all, really, deep down, and he promises to stop. And for a while, he kind of changes his behavior and he walks across this flimsy little bridge of hope like, I'm really doing it, it's a new me. And then he backslides and he messes up and he does it again and he disappoints everyone he loves and cares about and they're sick of it and they've had it up to here and they're like done with him. And so he's like filled with all this anger toward them but really shame at himself. And it's a hopeless situation, he's stuck. So is there like a bridge for someone like Michael or Melinda from where they are to where they want to be. And Janine, she had her retirement all mapped out, every little detail. And then there were some like financial surprises. And then there was an unexpected health thing that entered in. And at the same time, it's like her whole family started crumbling and everyone was mad at each other and she can't even see her grandkids right now. And the whole bridge to her future like crumbled. I have a good friend named Tony. He's my age. Uh, we grew up together, went to college together. Um, he grew up on a dairy farm. He's this brilliant guy. He went and got his medical doctorate degree and then another PhD because he needs two doctorates, I guess. But he devoted his whole life to helping little kids get better. In a, he ran a whole lab and a clinic for pediatric oncology. We stay in touch pretty regularly, so I wasn't surprised when he called recently, but I was not prepared for what he said. He said, Ben, I've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it's progressing very rapidly and already I'm losing my ability to put simple sentences together, to think, to write, to do my job. I can't remember things. I wanted you to hear from me while I still remember you that I love you. You talk about a bridge collapsing with your path to the future kind of like gone and the hopeful shores over there suddenly seeming like how am I supposed to get there it's in times like those when you start reaching for something like a rope called hope that will pull you through what's what's up with Tony I mean 
His body is like done now. Is that it? Is his mind, he's going to fold up his tent and put it away because he's done with it? Is there hope for a new body, a restored mind for Tony? Or is this all there is? Is there just like a bridge out ahead, no detour available kind of thing? I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think part of the reason is maybe the warmer weather triggered it. But also it's like 11 months ago, it was this time of year when my dad took a pretty sudden downward turn in his own health. And my, a couple of my siblings and I just made the trek to Minnesota and for like three weeks we just kind of moved in and hung out and held vigil and sat and sang and told stories and reminisced and cried and laughed together until we walked him home. And I'll never forget, you know, as, as you're as you're getting up to the edge of this life, when you know there's no more steps to take, watching what we know is going to be his last breaths as a mortal here, I mean, you tell me how much you think it would mean to me to know, to, how much would it mean to my mom, his wife of 72 years? How much would it mean to him to know that beyond the shadow of a doubt, there's a bridge that actually leads somewhere when this part's over? What do you think? That, hope is everything, isn't it? Like it really does matter. And that's why it's so hard when one of the bridges in our lives crumble because it just exposes us and reminds us how vulnerable we are and leaves us all kind of longing for hope and feeling so stuck, whether we're stuck in a sin or that we can't forgive ourselves for or can't fix or whether we're stuck in a situation that we, we're not in charge of, whether it's something that just makes us super sad or sorrowful or we got anger or anxiety or some failure or fear, it doesn't matter. Or whether we're stuck like my friend Tony, like what happens when I'm at the end of the road of my physical life? Is that just a dead end too? Are we just stuck? I think a lot of people actually live their lives that way, stuck. And, and occasionally we build these flimsy little temporary bridges that we know aren't going to hold us when push comes to shove, but we go over those for a while. And I think a lot of us, we look good on the outside, but inside we all want to know, is there real hope? Like not some religious answer. Every once in a while a song comes along that seems like it just captures something that you feel so deeply and poignantly that it just resonates it kind of gets you. And I, I felt that way when I listened to a song by the artist named Jelly Roll. <laughs> and the song is called Save Me. And I've asked our team to play it for us. And just listen and let, let the truth, let your heart ache for a minute. Not just with one guy's sad story, but with the human condition that none of us can fix because life is hard and the song is real. It talks about when bridges go out and we're stuck and we get to the place where we finally say, I need someone to save me. Give it a listen. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful song in some ways, but it's tragic. You know, it doesn't end very positively, does it? It's just a lot of um, language about how broken a person can feel sometimes, like a lost cause. It's a, it's a soul really hungry for hope. And I don't care who you are, whether you've had a really hard life and turned to some bad stuff and, you know, you're trying to find peace at the bottom of a bottle like this song, or whether you're all squeaky clean and, you know, walking the straight and narrow, none of us has an answer for sin we cannot forgive and sickness we can't heal and situations we can't fix and our own death that is staring us in the face. And nobody got an answer for that one. And it doesn't matter who you are, we are late, sooner or later, if we're smart at all, instead of just walking over flimmy bridges hoping they won't crash, knowing they will, we say something like what that guy's saying. I, need, I think I might need something, someone. That's exactly where, um, it's not a bad place to be, by the way. And it's where... Um, the friends and family of a man were one day after their brother, the leader of their family, had died. His name was Lazarus. He lived in a little town outside of Jerusalem 
in the time of Jesus. In fact, he and his sisters, Mary and Martha, who lived together, they were really good friends of Jesus. We know he spent a lot of time there, ate meals there. They were as close of friends as he probably had. They were his people. Jesus is working a couple miles away in a nearby town, and someone comes up to him out of breath one day, Jesus, your really good friend that you really love a lot, Lazarus, is super sick, they say. And Jesus says something kind of cryptic here. The first thing he says is, he says, well, he may be sick, but this is a sickness that will not end in death. And he doesn't mean that Lazarus isn't going to die, like he's going to get better. He doesn't mean that because, in fact, Lazarus is going to die, and Jesus knows it. What he means is, it's not going to end in ultimate death because death from now on in me is no longer the end. I mean, this is crazy talk, right? It's crazy talk. But he's saying that even though he dies... It's not going to be the end, and God's going to end up using this whole thing. God's going to use what you all think of as the worst thing you can imagine, death, to bring glory to him. And what Jesus is doing, sees, he's giving a little sneak peek. He's giving a preview of what, in fact, he's going to do, not only in Lazarus' life when he raises him from the dead shortly. He's giving a sneak peek what he's going to do in his own life when he rises again from the dead. And that's a sneak peek he wants them and all of us to know is what can happen in your life if you trust in Jesus. And that's what he means when he says, it's a sickness, but it's not going to end in death. He's building a bridge to hope that can never be destroyed. Now, they don't, if you know, you know, but they don't get a word of it. They're like, whatever, they don't get it. And they head to the house. John chapter 11, verse 11, he says something else that they still don't get. He says, now our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now let's go. I'm going to wake him up. Again, Jesus kind of messes with us sometimes. Like, he uses the phrase, fallen asleep. And that can mean a couple of things, right? Like, it can, when we say fall asleep, it can mean literally, I put my head in the pillow and take a snoozer, fall asleep. Or, guess what it actually means most of the time in the Bible? And still today we might use that expression. What does it mean? Yeah, it means like you're dead. <laughs> and so it's kind of interesting. When you think about it, physical sleep is like a bridge that, that kind of connects us from one day to the next. You're, you're going there about your day, here's one day, and then you're like, I'm going to go to bed now. You put your head on the pillow and you go to sleep, and that sleep itself is a bridge until you wake up and you're refreshed and you're like, you're renewed, you're new again. At least that's the way it's supposed to work. And Jesus is saying Lazarus has fallen asleep. And he means he's dead, but he's, it's not a big deal, y'all. I know you think it's the worst thing ever, but it's not a big deal. Because of who I am and what I'm going to do, it's like he's taking a nap. The sting of death, the finality of death, the fear of death, the dread of death in Jesus Christ, it's not a dead end, it's a nap. That's a whole different way of looking at reality, isn't it? I have the power of life and death. You don't have to fear death any more than you fear going to bed at night. I have the power over death, which means he's got the power over everything else. And if he can build a bridge of hope from life to death, then when you're stuck, Jesus can build a bridge of hope out of anything. Does that make sense? If he can beat death, he can beat anything. So he's falling asleep. I'm going to wake him up. You look at the next few verses there, verses 12, 13, 14 and following. The disciples think Jesus means Lazarus is sleeping, and that's a good thing because he's been real sick, and he probably needs to sleep to get better. And Jesus just says, no, no, no. Okay, when I said falling asleep, guys, he's dead. <laughs> he makes it really clear that they get it, that they know that he knows Lazarus is going to be dead. And he actually says something strange. He says, I'm actually kind of glad because now you're going to be able to see who I am and what I'm going to do. So they get there. And of course, Lazarus has been dead. He's been dead four days when they get there. And Martha, the sister, friend of Jesus, she comes running out of the house, running down the road to meet Jesus. Now think about Put yourself in her shoes. A major bridge in her life has just collapsed. And she is like at her wit's end. In that culture, like the man of the house was probably your livelihood your protector, your provider, your future, your inheritance, everything. She's stuck, and she's sad, and she's scared, and she feels hopeless, and she says words almost like I bet some of us have said, if you've ever lost someone close to you, maybe you've said these words to God. If you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Where were you? And it's words of fear and anger and hurt. And Jesus 
says to her some other words that she didn't get either. He says, your brother's going to rise again. She thinks he's giving her some kind of conventional, nice pat on the back funeral encouragement talk like people always do that doesn't mean anything. And she says, okay, thanks. And that's when Jesus lays on her the truth bomb that's at the center of our Easter celebration today that she didn't really get it fully at first, but most people today don't get it either. But here it is. It's the difference. It's the difference in having a bridge and no bridge. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus looks at her and here's what he says. I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me and lives their life in me. Anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? Jesus is saying, I'm not, gonna, I'm not just able to do a resurrection trick. I'm not able to give life. He says, I am life. I am resurrection hope. Life, everything Martha was looking for in that moment of desperation with her bridge collapse, Jesus is saying, I am that. And it's that message for us too. If you will trust in me just as surely as you put your head on the pillow before a nap, trusting that you will wake up on the other side refreshed, you can no longer fear death the same way after you know Jesus and everything else that makes you feel stuck you don't have to look at it the same way because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. No longer is death our greatest enemy. And then he says those words, do you believe this? Just to make sure we all know, this is not like some philosophy, not like some game here. It's like, do you believe this? And she responds beautifully by saying, I trust you, Jesus. You're the one that God sent. You're the son of God. And if you know, you know. And then... And then Jesus goes to the grave of Lazarus, his close friend. And the Bible says, it said, you know what it says? It's the shortest verse in the Bible. He says Jesus wept. He wept because he lost one of his best buddies. And he was sad. And he's with us and understands. He's, he's acquainted with grief and sorrow. But I think, I think he wept for a lot more. I think he wept for the same reason I wept when I hung up the phone after talking to Tony. And the same reason you weep when you send your loved one home I think he looked at the sin and the sorrow and the sickness and the sadness and everybody crying around him and he just thought to himself, this is not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way God wants it to be and we, we need someone to save us. And so then in a sneak peek of his own resurrection in a few days after that and in a sneak peek of how he will one day, the Bible says, make all things new, he shouts into that grave hole and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And can you imagine dead man walking? This guy gets up, he's walking up, peeling off his grave clothes. Can you imagine that family and how excited they would be? He steps right over death, back out into the daylight, and that means if we're not stuck in our graves, y'all, we're not stuck anywhere. And there's nothing God can't do. Do you believe this? Take a look at this screenshot here. It's basketball season. I know some of you are, are more into it than others, but um, here's, a, here's, a, here's a shot from a game a couple weeks ago. This is women's NCAA. The team in orange here is the Tennessee Volunteers. They were supposed to win this game. Well, it looks like they are going to win this game. They're up 73 to 71. There's no time on the clock, right? The team in white here is South Carolina. They're over here. For all intents and purposes, this game is over. There's, well, wait a second. There is 1.1 second on the clock but we all know that's not enough to do anything. So hope is gone. Time is up. This game is over. Tennessee's up by two. What are you going to do? All right. So here's what happens. I want you to notice something here. There is one second on the clock. And this girl's going to throw the ball in. And they got to make a basket in one second. They got to make a three-pointer because that's the only kind of basket that'll work. But here's the thing. The coach calls a play that nobody expected or would ever believe would happen. Look at this girl right here. See her? Nobody's guarding her. Nobody, they left her wide open. Do you know why? Because that girl is a senior, and in her entire career, she has never attempted a three-point shot, which is the only way they're going to win the game. They didn't even cover her. 
Not in her freshman year, not in her sophomore year, not in her junior year or her senior year. They don't even cover her. You all know where this is going, don't you? Watch what happens over the next 14 seconds. Here we go. One second on the clock. Inbound that ball. Ready, go. She gets the ball, throws it up. Time expires. Game over. Wow. <laughs> listen, my friend. Listen, listen, listen. A few days after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they arrested Jesus. They put him on a mock trial with trumped-up charges. They whipped him and they beat him and they dragged him to the streets. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they spat, him and spat on him and mocked him. And he carried a cross and carried your sin and your shame and your sorrow and your sickness on his shoulders. And he went to the cross and they nailed him up. They poked his side with a spear. He said, it is finished. And he died. And it looked for all the world like it was game over. Like time was up. And hope was lost. They laid him in a tomb and they rolled that stone over its mouth. And when they did, everyone was heading for the exits. The disciples were, they were discouraged. The devil's licking his chops. You know, he's already breaking open champagne. But God had a little play up his sleeve that nobody saw coming because no one had ever run it before. You don't come back from death after all. And I don't know how much time was on the clock, but God was right on time. And on the third day... Jesus rose again, and we're not talking about a ball game. We're talking about a game changer because if he defeated death once and for all, then Jesus, Jesus' resurrection is your resurrection too. And when he walked out of that grave, it means he's alive and he's still with us. And the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the Bible says, is available to us and at work in us in our lives. And God can do even the impossible when life is hard when it's really difficult, when the bridge is out, when you feel like no one should waste time on me. God has built a bridge in Jesus Christ that can never be destroyed. Jesus made the shot, y'all. You get that, right? He made the shot. It's game over. And nothing's too hard or impossible for God. He didn't just say, I'm the resurrection and the life. He backed it up. And he built a bridge and when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, man, that's a game. It, it's a game changer. And that's what we celebrate on Easter. It means we're never stuck. Never stuck in our sin. Never stuck in a situation. And when you die, and you are going to die, you will not get stuck in your grave if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And then... I guess it comes down to the same question that he asked Martha. And the living Jesus is here today, standing in front of you. Here's his question. I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you? If you do believe that he is your bridge of hope, your resurrection in life, you're saying, I believe. He's my bread of life. He's my vine. He's my good shepherd. I, he's, he's here in my life, and he's my bridge. Do you believe this? And if you do, some kind of response is required, is necessary. I don't think Jesus is just looking for words like, yeah, I believe, but he's always looking for a... Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just tell us things? He always backed it up with his actions. And when you say, I believe, you need to back it up with some action. So in the Bible, when someone says, I really do trust Jesus, what must I do to be saved? The Bible's not unclear about the answer. One of the most clear answers would be in, in, the, in this practical verse in, in Acts 2, verse 38. They asked him one day, what, what must we do? And the answer that Peter, who was with Jesus, says is, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise, he goes on to say, is not just for you here standing here today, but for all those who will come after. He's talking about us, which means that all that stuff works for us. What do I got to do? How do I back up my statement, I believe? Well, you turn to God because he alone is your hope. And if you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, then you back it up. You demonstrate it the same way they did in the Bible. You turn away from sin, you turn to God, and you get baptized. Straight up. That's what the Bible says. That's why we have pools set up today. 
here and at every one of our campuses because some of us need to turn to God and turn away from some stuff and say, I do believe and I'm ready to back it up. God backed it up in what he did with Jesus Christ through his love, through his death, through his resurrection. And if you're ready to say, I believe, then you back it up too. You follow Jesus in a series of steps and your first steps ought to be into the waters of baptism. So, now, when we start talking about baptism, I realize it raises lots of questions. So let's take a minute to let the Bible answer a few common questions about baptism. Fair enough? Everybody with me? Let's do Q&A. How about you do the Q, I'll do the A. Sound fair? What's your first question? What's that? Oh, I hear it. When should I be baptized? Great question. Well, when the people asked Peter, what should we do? He said this. He said, repent and be baptized. Guess what? 3,000 of them got baptized right on the spot, immediately. In chapter 8 of Acts, when this uh, guy's riding along in a chariot with Philip, he finally understands the truth about Jesus. And he goes, look, here's water right here. Let's do it right now. And they did. Acts 16, it's the middle of the night. A jailer kind of figures out who Jesus is, and he's like, I don't care if it is 3 a.m. I'm going to get baptized. Acts 16, 33 says, immediately. So some of you are like, when should I get baptized? The answer might just be like, Mm, what time is it now? Now. Some of you are like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. Don't I need to learn some more stuff? Don't I have to know the Bible better or clean up my act or get some habits under control? And I would just remind you that baptism in the Bible anyway is not a sign of maturity, not a symbol of your growth. It's a beginning. It's a birth. It's for someone who wants to be brand new and get started. And the people in the book of Acts, they heard one sermon on the resurrection and they said, what should we do? And they said, get baptized and they did it right then. So it wasn't something that you get around to someday. The real question is, if, if Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life, and he says, do you believe this? If your answer is yes, then the time for baptism, I would say, is now. So look, here's water. What do you know? What's that? Oh, why should I be baptized? Great question. I have a slide for that, in fact. <laughs> Why should you be baptized? First and foremost, because Jesus asks you to. Jesus himself was baptized as an example for us, and then he commands it, like, go make disciples of everybody, and when you do, baptize them. And I'm, I'm just, honestly, I'm not sure we should need any other reason than that. We, I'm Jesus, I'm going to trust you with my eternity. I just don't know if I can trust you to get in the water. It's like, yeah, you can. So someone might say, well, are you saying I have to? I understand that question. Do I have to get baptized? I would just gently push back and suggest to you that might be the wrong question. You know, it's kind of like saying, well, what's the least I can do and still get in? Okay. I mean, I know he hung on the cross and bled and died, but I have to get wet? It's like, yeah, that's the deal. It's the wrong question. Is that Who, who should be baptized? Great question, ma'am. Um, Peter said, well, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Jesus said, go and baptize all people, all nations. In fact, every time a person comes to Christ in the Bible, every single example, every single time they are baptized. In fact, there's no example in the Bible of a person who follows Jesus who's not baptized in the early church. In Scripture, baptism is always connected to anyone who says, I believe, I'm ready to trust, follow, turn my life away from that toward God. That's who. So, by the way, um, if, if Jesus says, do you believe this, and your answer is yes, then I would say you're ready. Now, this is why we don't practice infant baptism at Mountain, okay, where we don't baptize babies. First of all, we don't see that example in Scripture. Um, and also, mostly because a baby is not able to do the things that the Bible talks about with baptism. A baby can't say, I believe, or turn their life around, or begin to really follow Jesus and make those decisions like that. What we do instead is we have these beautiful parent and child dedication services where we hold up our babies and we just say, God, help us, and we pray, bless these babies, love them, but God, help us to raise these kids and point them in a direction that they will go so that they will naturally want to learn to follow Jesus and choose to say yes to him and choose to be baptized of their own choice because actually no one can make that decision for them. And someone might say, well, what if I was baptized as an infant? Is it kind of like 
disrespectful if I'm baptized again today, you know? And I would say, according to the hundreds and hundreds of people at Mountain who've had that very story, I would say no. In fact, what many have said is something like this, like, thank you, mom, dad, priest, pastor, for how you held me up in church that day when I was an infant or just a little one. And you prayed for me and blessed me and what you meant for me that day and the spiritual seeds you planted in my life. Thank you for all of that. And now I want to own it. I want to echo it. I want to affirm it and choose it for myself and fulfill all the things you hoped for and prayed for that day when you held me up in church. Well, what if, what if I've been trying to live as a Christian, maybe for a long time even, but I've just never thought much about baptism? Or it's just never been around it or thought it would be that important. And our coaching to you would be, once you understand the desire of Jesus and the example of Scripture concerning baptism or anything else for that matter, once you do, you should just do it. Just do it. Go ahead. And if you made the decision to trust Christ 10 minutes ago or 10 days ago or 10 years ago, it doesn't really matter. Just like as soon as you know, go, go, go for it. What, what's that? Oh, how? How should you be baptized? Great question. Well, if you've seen the baptisms around here, you know we like to dunk people. That's why we have these jacuzzis for Jesus around here. It's called baptism by immersion, and it's a, it means all the way under. First of all, it's what the word baptize literally means, to dip or dunk or plunge beneath water. It's the way Jesus appears to be baptized when he goes down into the Jordan River and comes up out. And, and baptism is just, I love baptizing by immersion because it's, it's a way that we get to say, I'm all in, you know? Like, all of me, my whole self goes under the water. And when you see someone baptized in a little bit, it's like even all of our body parts are cleansed and devoted to the Lord from here on out. My head goes under. I'm going to try to think the thoughts God wants me to think. My eyeballs go under. I'm going to try to focus on what he wants me to. I'm going to put my ears under and hear things that he wants me to hear. Even my private parts go under and I devote them to the Lord. My feet, my hands, all of me is now devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and baptism by immersion pictures that. But you know the main reason we love baptizing by immersion is that it retells the story of Easter itself, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It's like a dramatic reenactment, a, a physical reportrayal. And the early Christians, this is why they did it that way. All through the Bible, like at Romans chapter 6, Paul says, don't you know, when you're baptized, you're buried with the likeness of his death, only to be raised up to walk in new life, which means when you see people, and if it's you today, you get dunked beneath water, you are, you're basically saying, I believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I believe he died and he rose again, and you're, you're telling the story. But you're also saying this. You're saying, I'm going to die to myself. Like, there's parts of me that need to go away. Part of me needs to get dead and washed away because I want to live a new life, and you rise up out of that water to live a new life. And most importantly, you're saying, when I die someday, and you are going to die, I ain't going to stay dead, y'all, because of Jesus Christ and what he did. He built a bridge out of that water, and I am going to rise up, and I'm going to live forever with him. And baptism guarantees and seals that, and it's you saying, do you believe this? Yes, I do. And that's why I think they loved to baptize that way in the Bible. That's why we still do it that way today. Now, I know there's practical questions as well. Where do I go? What if I didn't sign up? Do I need a towel? Is the water cold? Are there fish in there? I didn't bring my water wings. Can Ben really hold me? Are you going to hold me under? How does this work, right? Listen, I would just say to you, this church has been around for 200 years. I've been baptizing people for 38 years. It's like we've only lost like about 50 people. So just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's like 35. But... You don't need to worry about any of that, honestly. I'm inviting you to answer the Jesus question, do you believe this with a heart of faith? And if it's a yes out of you, and that's your desire, then back it up the same way the people in the Bible backed it up. And that's why at every campus we've got people and a system and a process and water ready to welcome you to make a decision that you'll never, ever regret. Now, about a week ago, we had a big celebration for the completion of a new group of rooted people. And uh, a bunch of them wanted to get baptized on the last night, and they couldn't wait till Easter. So we let them do it. And I want you to watch this very short video and just let some of their joy seep into you for a second. Okay? Just watch the screen here.
A lot of joy going on there. So, yeah, it's fun. It's, it's, a, it's a celebration in a way. Now, some of you are still like, well, I couldn't do it today. And I'm like, yeah, why not? Yeah, you could. You really could. There are really actually no really good reasons that you can't. I'll just come out and say that. The guy in the Bible did it at midnight. You can do it right now. So, well, I haven't had a baptism class yet. It's like, yeah, you did. We just had one. Remember all the questions and answers? This was your baptism class. I don't have a towel. It's like... We have a mountain of fluffy white towels with one. Your name is embroidered in one already waiting for you. All right. Well, I don't have a change of clothes. It's like, that's all right. Your clothes will dry. It's not a bad day out there. Jesus walked out of a tomb with grave clothes on. You can walk out of church with wet clothes on one day. You'll be all right. Well, I wore something really light colored and I'm too revealing. And it's like we got T-shirts that will cover up whatever we need to cover up. And, and uh, if you're a lady with a you know, skirt or something, we got a pair of shorts for you, whatever. Well, I got to drive home. I don't want to get my car seats all wet. It's like, yeah, you'll be a little damp for a few minutes, but you'll be glad for all eternity. Sounds like a pretty good trade. <laughs> we'll give you a plastic bag and sit on it and whatever. And can you think of a better reason to get your car a little damp, right? And come on, let's be serious. What are you driving? <laughs> Bring your Maserati today? Come on. Your minivan will be fine, all right? So what about my stuff? Uh, my cell phone, my wallet, uh, my watch. It's like, are you going to take it over here? Leave it at the desk there. We're going to put it on Facebook Marketplace while you're in the water. It's like, what do you think? We got a system. We got a little bag and a guy named Guido is going to watch over it and it's all good, okay? Don't worry about it. Your stuff is going to be fine. Well, but my family isn't here or someone who's special to me isn't here to witness it. And I would just say it's a good thing this isn't between you and your family. It's between you and the Lord. And if today's your day, take it seriously and don't say no. The real barrier is in any of these excuses. It comes down to that when Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you say, I believe this, then you say yes and you follow him and your first step should be into the water. So I'm not giving a sales pitch. I just don't want anyone to miss the moment that you're going to wish you had. So this is a moment for anyone who's ready to publicly identify and say, declare, I believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I'm not looking for someone who's going to like, I want to try harder to live a better life. Nope. I'm not looking for someone trying to be a better person. I'm looking for someone to say, I need someone to save me. And if that's you, and you believe in Jesus, you should do this today, all right? Now, in about 60 seconds, I'm going to pray. And then after I say amen, we're going to have a song that we're going to sing. And then at that time, we're going to have a lot of movement. I'm going to take my microphone off so I don't get electrocuted. I'm going to take my shoes off. And at every campus, some friends with campus pastors are going to get in the water. And we're going to be ready to welcome you. And there's tables. Here, it's over there. At every campus, there's a table. And you're just going to go to the table and, 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 and give us your name. And, and we'll hold your stuff and give you a shirt. And it's, it's, it's going to be easy. And you're going to be glad you did. And we'll just help you, walk you right up here. I'm talking to several groups of people. As soon as I'm done praying in about 30 seconds, if you've already signed up to be baptized, that's when you move, as soon as we stand up and sing. You just move right on over there. If um, you are one of our baptism helpers, you move at the same time as well. If you've already been baptized, you relive your baptism in your spirit right now. You celebrate, you rededicate your life to God and pray your guts out like crazy for everyone else around you. That's the fourth category I'm talking to you. If you believe Jesus is alive... And he is the resurrection and the life. If your answer is yes, your next steps are into the water of baptism, all right? Even if you weren't planning on doing it, you can do it right now. It's a spontaneous thing. I'm going to say amen. You can make your way. You can bring anybody with you you want. We're all in this together. Everybody ready? When I say amen, we move. Let's pray. God, hear the cry of our hearts. We want to say we believe in you. We want help with our unbelief, but we want you to kind of help us now just move in our midst so that every one of us is responding to you in the way that you are calling us to move. And if that means, you know, stepping across the bridge toward hope, toward you in some important way in our life, that we will do it trusting in your name. And if that is baptism for us, that we would be obedient to that very first step as well. And we say it all in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's go.